Wonderful. First, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. I am thrilled to be here to introduce our speaker today for our June Town Hall. Um, but just want to start with just thanking everyone for their participation. We couldn't be more excited at the success of these events. Um, once a month at this hour seems to be just wonderful. Um, we do have a great town hall also coming up in July. Um, I'll just touch briefly on that. We'll talk a little bit about it at the end, but it will be a presentation from Eversource, an investor owned utility in the Massachusetts area, as well as HEAT, um, discussing their pilot program doing district geothermal systems through an investor owned utility. So, um, as always, we'll start with, if anyone has any questions during this presentation, please feel free to put those in the chat function uh, and we will hold those towards the end and then I will uh, read those out loud to Brian and we'll, we'll have some great discussion hopefully. Um, but if you have any other questions about IGSPA or any IGSPA related items, you're always welcome to send an email to info at igspa.org and we'll be happy to get back to you. So without further ado, I couldn't be more excited to have Brian here from MEP to talk about district energy systems. Um, it's great, Brian's a co-board member here with IGSPA and couldn't be more excited to have him present on this topic. So Brian, if you wanna go right ahead, we'll just get right into it. Sounds good, thank you, Courtney, appreciate yeah. that. Um, yeah, great to be here and welcome everybody. Uh, today, we're going to touch on um, a little bit about residential multifamily community district geothermal systems. Now, um, I apologize in advance if some of you may be on the call thinking uh, this was going to be more about campus, uh, college campus, you know, district systems. And um, we've decided to, uh, you know, uh, pare this down into two different town halls. So that'll come later this fall. Uh, we'll have another town hall re regarding the, the college campuses. So today is going to be primarily focused around, you know, residential and, and multifamily uh, more, you know, well, I guess uh, everything from single family all the way up through, you know, multifamily mid-rise uh, towers and, and so forth. So with that, uh, you know, we'll get started. And so the first thing is, you know, always a question why, you know, why would we do a district system uh, versus just doing, you know, either a, a one off uh, residential single family home or whether it's a one off building a townhouse or whatever the case may be, you know, why would we not just put a loop in for each specific uh, heat pump or, or building and why would we want a community system or a district system. And so there's a couple of real factors in you know, looking at that and, and trying to determine whether or not it's right for the project, because it's not always the right uh, system for the project. This isn't a 100 percent, you know, this is the way it should be done. This is really more about project specifics. But these are some questions that maybe you would ask yourself or the client and and, um, you know, does it make sense for the project? So the first thing is, is there any diversity in the project uh, when you look at the buildings that are that you're looking at heating and cooling? And, um, you know, trying to figure out if it makes sense to combine those to reduce the upfront cost in the overall ground loop heat exchanger. Because as we know in this business, I think uh, uh, people that have been in this business, the geothermal industry, you know, the first cost has always been the, the largest hurdle that we have to overcome in order to make this more widely adapted, you know, in the marketplace. So uh, when you have diversity in buildings, uh, between heating and cooling and maybe some other things that are happening within the building. Maybe you're going to look at domestic hot water use or, you know, maybe it's more of a heavy cooling uh, uh, thermal profile. And so now you've got a building next door that may be more heating dominant. So maybe those two could share some energy and, you know, overall reduce the size of the bore field. So diversity is the first thing that we always want to look at. So when we get into, you know, what are the steps in, in designing a system like this, uh, diversity and uh, coming up with an aggregate load profile to figure out, you know, what are our simultaneous loads? How can we reduce the overall ore field? And then, of course, reduce the overall uh, upfront cost, which is uh, one reason why we would do this. The second thing is, you know, um, when you have larger systems and you have a lot of underground lateral piping to connect everything, of course, those pipes still transfer energy. So every lineal foot of pipe that's installed in the, in the earth um, transfers heat. It's just at what rate? And uh, is it a benefit or is it actually, you know, a deficit to the, the overall heating and cooling? So 
you know, when you have a lot of lateral piping, those should all be accounted for. And that gets a little bit uh, more complicated, of course, um, but there are programs and, and uh, calculations obviously that can be done to account for all of that and determine, okay, if I have, you know, a mile of, of lateral piping to connect 300 homes, you know, how much energy can I transfer just in that pipe alone that will also reduce the amount of uh, ground loop heat exchanger that would be installed. So, you know, again, all piping as heat transfer. And so we just want to take a look at that and whether or not that's going to be a benefit for us. And then number three really is kind of more the biggest question. And that's more of a financial question uh, than it is a technical, you know, will it work or how does it work kind of a question. So it's really about the third party ownership. Who's going to own and operate a district system? And whether it be a you know, single family development and you have a developer or a third party company that wants to come in and own and operate a geothermal asset, or if you have, uh, which we've seen over the last decade, a lot of um, you know, ESCO type performance contracting type companies coming in and owning and operating you know, over the course of 20 or 30 years the geothermal asset and then you know uh, basically selling the thermal energy back to to the to the users so um in with district systems it becomes more viable as a project for those type companies just because of the capital investment thresholds that need to be met uh you know we already have utility precedents and that can easily be replicated uh, and used as as a you know basically as a thermal utility and when you look at individual buildings, but more specifically individual homes or even like townhome developments, um, you know, one loop per home just doesn't offer the benefit to third party ownership because of having, you know, three or 400 different customers that you have to bill, or, you know, it's easier for them to opt out of not installing a system, uh, you know, and then how do you, how do you recoup your costs one at a time versus an entire, you know, community wide system. So. Those are all questions that really are more for the developer or the owner in the end and uh, whether or not this becomes a financially viable uh, system. And then the number four would be really more about, uh, again, back to, to space and cost, uh, if you're gonna use any hybrid systems you know, within, within, the, within the total system and, and uh, you know, again, looking at the load profile, looking at a lot of other factors, how much space do you have, what's the cost, and does it make sense to add in a single point of use hybrid system that can either reduce peak loads or balance uh, the load profile so we can, in the end, again, it's all about reducing that uh, upfront cost in the, in the bore field design and, and installation. And with a district system, you have the opportunity to use a single point of use versus if you had, let's say you have six mid-rise towers that you want to interconnect, well, each one of those towers would have to have a, you know, hybrid system installed. Whereas if you interconnected them into a, into a district system, now we can, you know, uh, size one hybrid plant and, and utilize that in one location for the total. And that's often very attractive for, you know, developers, builders of these type of buildings, because we can reduce the amount of equipment on roofs and, and so forth. And um, it, it uh, tends to work very well. So anyway, that's the number four kind of question. Why would we look at a district system? Now the challenges to these systems, obviously, um, number one is cost, you know, uh, especially when you look at single family home developments. If you look at a single family home development, the, the least cost is to eliminate all of the lateral piping, all the distribution piping that would be the district that would connect everything into a common system. You know, putting one loop outside of every home and just running the piping into the heat pump is certainly the lowest cost. But as we mentioned before, um, you know, and I think a lot of people in this industry know that, you know, as we move more towards utility type scale systems and getting utilities involved, the one-off loops just don't tend to lend themselves as, uh, you know, financially as attractive as, as putting in a community system. Uh, and again, then you also have to come up with uh, larger pump stations to move all the fluid throughout the district. So, you know, how is that going to be done? Where will that be located? Uh, there's obviously a lot more volume of fluid that's installed. And so when you look at antifreeze, if you're in the northern climates, uh, the chemical treatment potentially, all those things would 
add up to more cost. So you really have to look at, you know, what's my CapEx versus my OpEx and does this make sense, you know, uh, as a, you know, if, if this was gonna be a utility owned or uh, third party owned and operated type system versus, you know, each homeowner just buying their own system, okay? Um, and then of course, if uh, you're doing anything within the streets, the network of streets, it's, you know, you've got all the issues with right of way, uh, infrastructure access, you know, easements, uh, because this is now becoming more of a utility and it can be rather complex and difficult as this is somewhat new uh, from a thermal asset. It's not new, obviously, because we've been running city water and sewer and, and natural gas and other things in the city for a long time. Um, but because you do have some precedent, but you don't have, you know, the absolute precedent of geothermal piping in the street uh, as a utility, this, this can be a challenge to work through. And uh, we've seen that personally in a, in a couple of projects that we're working on now that, that took quite a bit of time to get through the city uh, red tape, if you will, about, uh, you know, all the easements and right away and, you know, potential maintenance and, and repair and so forth. Um, and then of course, you know, you really have to look at your energy use. And when you look at these larger systems, now you're gonna have more parasitic energy use and pumping power. So your design is really critical to minimize that because you can easily you know, eat up any savings you would have with the geothermal heat pump through parasitic, parasitic energy use, um, which then negates the, you know, the whole reason for doing this. Uh, so you know, those are some of the cost implications that you really need to look at when you're looking at a district system. Number two is the space. And the reason why you know, these tend to uh, you know, be looked at is maybe you don't have a lot of space uh, as you would with maybe a school where you've got a ball field or something, you've got a large area to put a common heat exchanger and you can, you know, run that to the building and you've got lots of space to do that or, or even the college campus world where you've got a lot more green space. When you get into urban settings, either with, uh, you know, townhome developments or condominium developments or even, even you know, suburban um, single family developments, there's really not a lot of space for loop fields. So, you know, where are we going to put the loop fields? And that becomes a challenge. And so those are some of the things you really have to look at and actually what lends itself to a district system uh, because we don't have space. Now maybe we can utilize that right away uh, in the street for the infrastructure and the lateral piping and even the vertical loops uh, within the, the, you know, underneath the street um, as space to, to allow that to happen. So uh, those are all things that you really need to be, you know, looking at when you're looking at district systems. Where are we going to put all this stuff? And then it's not just the, the heat exchanger, but it's also your pump stations. You're going to have, you know, if you're interconnecting everything, you're going to have some type of a shut off at the street or at the property line to, you know, as a service valve uh, for each, either, whether it's a building or a home or, you know, whatever the case may be. And, um, you know, as well as the pump stations, are they going to be above ground, below ground? You know, we've got to move the fluid throughout the district. So wh where does all that go? And those are all really good questions up front to kind of iron out early on. And, you know, if you're developing a master plan or something about, you know, um, wh where's that stuff going to be housed and, and what's it going to look like? And, um, you know, we're working on a project where they're calling them lawn ornaments because now all of a sudden you've got all these pedestals for electrical services that are going to the pump stations and you've got water uh, pedestals for makeup water valves. And so you've got a lot of things that are now, um, you know, on the corners of streets that people wouldn't necessarily have other than maybe a few transformers that uh, are taking away a little bit of the aesthetics of the development. So, you know, those are really challenging things that you have to work through with the developer, the builder, and, and, and of course, uh, selling that to the, to the end user as well. And then uh, number three would be the logistics or operation. Again, working through all the red tape with the city and, and civil and, and, and everything else that goes along with infrastructure. Uh, that's quite challenging, takes a lot of time. Uh, you know, be prepared to, to work for a year or two to get through a lot of that, um, you know, red tape and then get them to understand, you know, what this is uh, because they'll have all kinds of, you know, regulations and how close you can get certain pipes to other pipes and whether or not they cross each other and should be insulated, uninsulated, you know, 
um, have sleeves, you know, all this kind of stuff. So uh, because this is relatively new for a lot of the people that work in those um, city planning and, and uh, you know, in that world, it, it can be quite challenging to just work through all that. Uh, what's the serviceability of the assets, if any is needed? Of course, geothermal, we all know, is very, very maintenance friendly. But, uh, you know, in, in a district system, you're going to have some components, especially pumps, that are going to need to be serviced from time to time. And, you know, uh, how accessible is that? If it's in the street, for instance, if it's in a vault in the street, you know, now you've got to close off the street or you have a, you know, a manhole cover that has to be ex accessed. So you're, you know, you get to block off the street. And so th these are all the things that need to be discussed and understand that um, this is what's going to happen in the future. You know, what, what happens when they repave the street? How does that affect the vaults? And, you know, uh, because two different company, you know, that different company owns that. Uh, asset and you know how does that all work? Uh, what if there's any removal or abandonment process after a life cycle? If there's anything that needs to be done from that perspective with the city, um, again right away access agreements and and um, you know all your serviceability issues. So those are all logistical things that need to be thought of and uh, brought up. And, and certainly the city that you're working in uh, will probably bring those issues to to light as you move forward. So what are the steps in developing, you know, a district system, uh, you know, community system? Well, first step in any, you know, any commercial setting uh, when you're looking at HVAC is, you know, developing a good thermal energy profile. And developing that thermal profile, obviously, if you have multiple buildings, is coming up with an aggregate profile. So we know, you know, what are our peaks? What are our simultaneous loads, if any? What are our unbalanced uh, annual loads? Do we need to try to balance the system to you know, to um, make sure we have long-term health of the of, of the system. Is there any opportunity for multiple types of sources or sinks in the area? And, um, you know, these are all things that you want to look at as you're looking at the load profile and going, okay, what do we need to do here? Do, do we need to, you know, shave the heating, shave the cooling? Can we take advantage of any simultaneous? You know, generally, you're not doing a, a true central plant you, you know, you're still running multiple heat pumps at the same time, but you are still sharing that load and, um, and can reduce some load. Uh, and I'll kind of give you some examples here as we move forward. But um, so again, diversity in the buildings, you want to look at aggregate loads, simultaneous loads. You want to look at all the scheduling and occupancy and, you know, believe it or not, even in residential single family homes, there is some diversity because of human nature with scheduling you know, when you go to work, when you, you know, when you get home, when you're doing laundry, when you're doing dishes, you know, taking showers, et cetera, all those things impact your daily schedule, which of course then plays into the total diversity of, of uh, you know, uh, of the aggregate load. So um, you, you would think that, you know, on a peak winter day in, in Northern climates that everybody's peaking at the exact same time. Well, that's true, but they're not, if you had, simu you know, exactly the same size homes sitting next to each other, they're still going to have uh, they might be peaking, but their peaks could be different. Okay. Somebody's trying to mute me or something. I'm sorry about that. Anyway, so again, and then, um, you know, as you're looking at the total project, are you looking at, uh, or was there a master plan developed? How is it going to be phased potentially? Uh, is it existing? Is it new? You know, are there renovations that are happening with existing buildings? And I've got some examples that I'm going to get to and that I think will maybe help bring this all together as we move forward. Okay, uh, so thermal profiles. Again, developing these is very important. And what I'm showing here is that uh, we did a, uh, an apartment complex where um, we did thermal profiles with and without domestic hot water. Now, this was a northern climate uh, project. And so you can see the heating load is quite dominant over the cooling load. And adding domestic hot water actually increased our overall heating load. So it even imbalanced it further. However, in the summertime, we did have some simultaneous uh, opportunities here that we could operate. And what that does is really offers the... Um, the domestic hot water a much greater efficiency because we're, you know, uh, putting heat in and then taking heat right back out. 
you know, again, we can we can look at that. And if this was in the southern climate, you know, we could actually look at that and go, okay, well, if we're taking heat out when we're putting heat in, can we reduce the bore field? So, you know, coming up with strategic ways to try to balance your thermal profile and using different, uh, you know, sources or sinks or even different uh, HVAC systems like domestic hot water. Maybe you've got snow melt that if you've got a heavily cooling load profile, you can, you know, put snow melt in. You could put in a, you know, different uh, uh, heat exchanger. It, you know, you could have multiple styles of heat exchangers, for instance, a vertical and, and a pond loop, um, where the pond loop in the spring, if you have a heavy cooling load, could try to balance out the, you know, and, and, and bring the ground temperature back to its mean temperature in the spring, every spring, so we don't have to worry about temperature creep over time. So when you have district systems, you can really look at different sources and sinks that are available on site, you know, because the sites are larger. Or do you have any opportunities to work with different styles of heat exchangers or even different types of systems that can really help try to reduce that overall size of the heat exchanger, reduce your upfront cost, and really just balance it out so you have a long-term healthy uh, you know, asset that you can operate for, for many years. So then step two, obviously, is selecting that, that heat exchanger. What works for the site? You know, there isn't a, a right or wrong answer here. Typically, we see mostly vertical heat exchangers, but within that category, you also have many new technologies that are coming out that are looking very promising to help reduce the overall footprint uh, or square foot that's needed to get the same capacity. And uh, so, you know, those things are all being looked at and, and being designed out there in the marketplace. There's some great technologies out there. The horizontal loops, you know, obviously take a lot more space, large footprint. There's generally only a one type when you talk about commercial, but it could either be trenched or, or open pit style or, or directionally drilled. And then you've got the surface water, which is more, you know, like a pond loop or a lake loop. And again, can be done different ways. There's lots of different styles and types of heat exchangers that can go in uh, surface water type systems. And again, those are great if they're available. Uh, you know, lots of capacity depending on the size and the depth and whether it's a river or a lake, if it's natural or man-made. So, you know, there's a lot of things that can be analyzed. And oftentimes, you know, you could use multiple heat exchanger types on the same project, just depending on you know, again, looking at cost versus space versus, uh, you know, what, what's required for the, for the project. And then number three would be really selecting the type of distribution system that you're going to utilize for the project. And again, pump energy is very critical here. You wanna make sure that, you know, you look at your parasitic losses and, and analyze that, but there's a couple different ways you can do it. Now for community, residential and multifamily, it's generally either a one pipe or a two pipe distribution. The one pipe, which you'll hear a lot of people call an ambient system. They're technically all ambient because if we're circulating geothermal water, which is close to ground temperature, it would be your ambient. But a single pipe is uh, can be done and the key to that is putting different heat exchanger sources and spacing those evenly across your loads uh, throughout the district. Okay, and I'll show you a little bit more of that here in a minute. The two pipe, you know, obviously we can uh, connect two pipes to every load and we only need one central or common uh, heat exchanger seat source or sink and pumping station. Uh, obviously you need larger pipes and you know I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, but there, there's a lot, there's quite different, um, you know, design aspects to these two. And one isn't always the right answer. Again, it really depends on how the project lays out, what makes the most sense, uh, you know, how you can get to all of the structures that you're trying to serve and then where the, where the geothermal uh, source and sinks at, you know, how does that lay out within the project and that really determines, do I, can I use a one pipe, you know, because that would be the preferred method just because of upfront cost, or do I need to go to a two pipe type system? And then the four pipe is really where you've got more of a central energy plant and we're distributing hot and cold water then to all the buildings. That would be more your campus type uh, systems or your downtown, you know, urban setting district systems where you're serving hot and cold water to, to different buildings in more of an urban setting. That's your traditional, you know, district type energy. However, we're doing it with geothermal. 
So there's really two primary designs when it comes to residential community and multifamily community systems. One would be the central heat exchanger with the two pipe distribution. Uh, very similar to a standard one-off building with a common heat exchanger and multiple heat pumps throughout the building. So you've all seen, you know, elementary, middle and high schools that have one common loop field and the ball field, you know, unitary heat pumps throughout the building. That would be no different than if you had a common loop field, a pump station and, you know, 40 or 50 or 100 houses down the street. Uh, they're just not all under the same roof. Okay. Uh, with this particular system, you're going to need large pump stations to distribute the energy throughout the entire development. You've got a lot of piping uh, that those pumps have to push the fluid. The redundancy and resiliency is a little more difficult um, with this design, and, and I would say more so the phasing. You know, how do you phase this? It's you know, if you had a community where you had 300 homes over the course of five years, and you can break that up into phases. Well, if you're doing one common loop field there really is no opportunity to phase that. It gets more difficult, really. I mean, you, you can, but it's, it's certainly difficult. Um, again, you need a location for these large pump stations somewhere between the development and the heat exchanger. And um, it's potential to break them down into smaller systems, but uh, uh, oftentimes it's just one large system. And then of course, once you get from the pump station out to the load side, your distribution, you could potentially use a single pipe um, but again, the, the two pipe, you're gonna have larger flow rates, larger pipe sizes, larger pump horsepower, just be the nature of that system. So, you know, it doesn't look as good from that perspective, from an upfront cost and an operational perspective when you have, when you have that. Then the other, so this is what that would look like from just a diagrammatic uh, point of view. This is obviously very simple, but you have a ground heat exchanger at the bottom, a common loop. You have a common central pump station. And then you're running a two pipe, you know, to all the homes uh, and connecting everything. Okay, so again, I don't know any developments that are built in a rectangle this nice and neat. So what happens is when you get into especially the single family homes, you end up with a lot of crossover with the piping because with the two pipe system. It just gets really difficult to get a pipe, a supply and a return in front of every home without having anything cross over one another. And now you've also got all of your other infrastructure in the street uh, that you've got to work around. So again, because you're adding a lot more piping, it gets to be a little bit more challenging with this type of system on a typical residential community uh, system, okay? So then the other way to do it would be just what we call a one pipe distribution system or some call it an ambient system. But again, we're, we're gonna call it a one pipe. This is a little different design. Now we don't have one common heat exchanger. Now we actually use much smaller heat exchangers and they're scattered strategically throughout the development, injecting or, or rejecting um, heat into that ambient distribution loop, uh, but very strategically placed because we have to know, you know, you take so much heat out, we have to put so much heat back in or the, the you know, the fluid gets too cold. So it's, it's um, a little bit more goes into where those are placed. That's very actually, that's the most important part is where do we place those? And then of course you have to look at the site and go, well, does that actually work? Can I place those in areas where they need to be? Do I have room for that on site? So that, that that's the, you know, that's the dance when it comes to the one pipe distribution system. The nice thing about it is the smaller pump stations, um, you know, the, the ambient loop piping, Pumping is easily designed uh, around N plus one for redundancy. Uh, the, the other really great thing is if you lose, for some reason, something goes offline, you have a lot of redundancy, not only in pumping, but also in your heat exchanger capacity. And so you can have everything still operating almost at uh, full capacity, even when maybe one small heat exchanger goes offline. The single lateral pipe takes a lot less room. Um, you know, than, than two pipes, obviously. And you can also utilize multiple styles of heat exchangers um, in different locations, depending on the site. You can use some horizontals if they had a little green space or maybe a pond, if they had a retention pond. You could, you know, you could utilize a, a pond in, in one area versus just verticals everywhere. Um, the vertical loops could be placed under the street uh, versus in, you know, green space, if you don't have any green space. And, um, 
you have lower flow rates and smaller pipe sizes for the distribution piping, which, you know, again, is nice for the infrastructure within the street because of everything you have to work around, okay? And it's relatively easy to maintain a, you know, plus or minus three degree F uh, delta T from the first house on any section of pipe from one injection point to the next injection point. Uh, that's really all predicated on flow and, um, uh, you know, and then how much energy you're putting in where. So uh, that part can be done very easily um, if everything lays out correctly. So this is kind of what that would look like. Uh, again, very easy uh, diagrammatic uh, representation here, but you have all the houses throughout the neighborhood and then you strategically locate different vertical or, you know, heat exchangers, whatever that may be in different locations. And then, you know, as each home takes off, let's call it in heating mode, if every home is taking heat off of this pipe, okay, as it goes down and, and I get to the next injection point, you know, I wanna make sure that I'm not getting more than around three or, you know, four degrees here. Otherwise you start to impact efficiency from the, you know, the person that was lucky enough to get the first lot versus the last lot, you know, you're, you're starting to impact their energy uh, and utility costs. Okay, so you, you try to design that where you don't impact their efficiencies. And then also um, you've got multiple pumping stations to circulate the single pipe. And then you've got pumps that are injecting into each uh, you know, location. And then you've also got a pump, you know, just a small circulator because you have very little head loss from the heat pump itself out to the street. So your parasitic pumping loss is actually not you know, uh, as large as it would be if you had a two pipe system with one huge pump pumping the entire development, okay? So let's look at some projects and maybe this will help bring some of these uh, things home and, and and what we've been through on a number of different projects and, and you know, we've done both systems and can show you and talk about why. Um, this was one of the first systems we had done with a single pipe ambient uh, throughout the entire development. So this was a, uh, single family and multifamily. There's some townhomes and some row homes, back-to-back -back, um, uh, row houses in this development. So a total of 312 houses. It's a single six inch pipe that runs throughout the entire development. And as you can see, you have to be able to get that pipe in the front of every lot in order to get the service connection to that home. So we had a lot of uh, kind of zigzagging around to, to make that happen. But there's virtually no crossover except one location, which was right here. And that had to do with how the energy um, uh, injection points and the energy coming off, depending on those houses, you know, we could have just went around this way and back, but it worked better to come, to come the other direction. And that was strictly from an energy perspective and try to balance each section of pipe based on, you know, what our injection points are. So these are all the vertical loops that in the vault that gets injected into that spot. And then we have ambient vaults that circulate. There's, there's four sections to this development. So it's phased actually in four pieces, starting from the left going right. So they can develop this first phase, as you can see the bypass line here, bring on the second phase and, and so forth. And then you can see that there's some horizontal loops up here um, uh, that was initially part of the project that actually didn't happen. They went, ended up going all vertical loops. Um, but they originally wanted to put in some horizontals as well, just to kind of test it and see how they performed and what the, but the costs, you know, the cost structure just wasn't there. They actually cost as much as the, the vertical loops and, and it was going to be a challenge with the grading and so forth to get them in. So they ended up scrapping that. But as you can see, you have opportunities there to do different things with an ambient type system. And so it really, you know, uh, the key to this is locating these vertical pods in specific locations to be able to put energy in or take energy out and then allow the fluid to continue to flow and, you know, connect all the homes and, um, and, and balance itself out, uh, you know, uh, as, as the fluid moves around. A lot of redundancy, actually one ambient pump can pump this entire system uh, by itself. Of course, during a peak period, it would be you'd have more than three degree delta T across it. But, um, you know, and, and if one vertical loop goes down, you know, again, we can, we can still operate and everybody would still be able to operate just fine. The temperatures just change slightly. 
So I talked about lawn ornaments with this particular project, you know, we, we put everything within the street in the right of way. And so everything was underground uh, other than the pedestals that are serving these vaults. So these are the vaults that are underground in the street. As you can see with this diagram here, this is underground. And we had an electrical pedestal above ground that had to serve the electrical needs of the pump. And then we had a, a water pedestal at the four ambience for makeup water and, and, and uh, to maintain pressure on the system. Uh, so we have two different style of vaults. We have an ambient vault and then we have our vertical loop vault. So this is the injection vault that goes to the ambient. And then this is the ambient that just circulates throughout the development. And then this was the water pedestal vault and the, and the electrical vaults that housed the VFDs and the controls and everything because we didn't put that underground. So there was quite a bit more lawn ornaments, if you will, throughout the development that was, you know, very interesting to work through and you know uh, we had to keep them a certain size and everything else now you could certainly put these pumps above ground too and bring the piping up and then back down but now you're just adding uh you know bigger structures because then your electrical and your water can all be within that structure but it's a much larger structure so this is what it looks like just from a control and in a, in a diagram perspective so you have ambient vaults you have vertical loop vaults that do your injection um, you know, then you've got obviously heat pumps connected all the way around this whole development that are, uh, you know, with their own circulators that are taking either adding heat or taking heat off of the loop. So when we modeled this and we modeled it as an aggregate um, and we modeled it over 10 years and what the, the key to this is, as I mentioned before, with the single pipe, whether you're doing single family or there are multiple buildings, however you're doing it, is what's the temperature delta, what's your drop in between each uh, source or sink point. So these are all the vertical loop vaults throughout the development. And then each section of pipe basically is represented here. So you can see as it goes up and down, as it's going down, the houses are taking off and then we hit a, a vault that would inject heat and then it goes back up and then it goes back down. So, and same thing in the summertime. Okay, so those are key components to an ambient single pipe system that you have to model to make sure that you're not getting two out of line for efficiency for each of the different buildings that are connected and, and looking at that's how you space out your, you know, your injection points or your, or your, or your heat exchangers throughout the development. So those are key things that, whoops. Uh, that go back. Yeah, okay. Okay, another project. Uh, this one was a little bit different. This is an apartment complex. They had 26 total buildings. They didn't have room for one common loop field to run piping to one specific location and connect all 26 apartment buildings. They're uh, three-story buildings with anywhere from eight to 12 apartments per building. And this was an existing development. So there was, you know, uh, everything was already in place. It was a very mature uh, development. So trees and everything else. So the only place we had to put heat exchanges was parking lots. And, uh, what ended up happening here was we, we did a small micro community, if you will. So we put three to four buildings on each uh, geothermal heat exchanger. We ran that piping into one building, put a pump station, decoupled that pump from the other buildings, and then ran a supply and return. So a two pipe distribution to each of the building, three buildings. And then in those buildings, we have distributed heat pumps. In each one of those heat pumps has a small circulator that has enough power to just circulate back to that decoupling device, which was a, a hydraulic separator, uh, and, and back again. So very low pumping power. We actually, our, one of our tasks was to be under 50 watts per, um, I believe it was 50 watts per ton. Uh, I can't remember now, sorry. Um, anyway, they had very stringent guidelines on pumping power. So. Uh, we did have to upsize some piping uh, to make that happen, but it, it, it all worked. So even with a two pipe distribution, we were able to keep our pump horsepower down, keep the parasitic losses down. And we were able to downsize our heat exchanger slightly because we interconnected the buildings and took some diversity. And um, also because we didn't have space, you know, for, uh, we didn't have space for 26 individual loops. We also didn't have space for one common loop. So we had to go with, eight loops serving 26 buildings. So that worked very well. Uh, this was a townhome complex. And uh, this again, um, uh, did not lend itself towards a single pipe. 
if you look at the layout of this to try to get a single pipe in front of every one of these townhomes, you would have ended up having a lot of crossover. And so the idea here was that uh, a two pipe was better served. They have a mechanical room in the in the garage of the main level. They're, they're two story townhomes. And so um, you could serve every townhome from this two pipe system. But what we had to do was break it into two separate loops and have one common pump pump room. So we decoupled the loop fields. The loop fields actually, there's one over here and then one over here under the development. All those are brought up into manifolds in the pump room and then you've isolated the two. So that way we can, you know, we can get to every townhome without a lot of piping crossover. And um, so, you know, again, it, it really just depends on site specific, uh, how things lay out and what makes the most sense. This is uh, actually a mid-rise condominium complex. So there's six mid-rise towers on this, uh, you know, one city block. So there's multiple towers. There's a, a building here. There's one up here. Um, there's a building down here. You can see that. So what we did was we laid out these bore fields. We brought all these bore fields into manifold locations. Those manifold locations then run two pipes into a common pump room. Then we, we have a common loop pumping system decoupled from the building side. But because we have six individual mid-rise buildings, we didn't want the same fluid running through every single building. So each building then has its own heat exchanger. And uh, so we've got a two pipe distribution system here running to each heat exchanger decoupled from our common loop field, but we have five different uh, or four different, um, you know, loops and manifolds just to make all that work. This happens to be underneath the parking structure of the entire development. So it's a, a quite a challenging uh, project, but again, um, certainly the two pipe makes more sense here because you have, you know, all your, all your heat exchangers are relatively in the same proximity and can be brought into one location. And rather than trying to do a single pipe and, and connect these buildings to different, you know, the heat exchangers, that didn't make a lot of sense either, just because all your energy is coming from one place. This is another project we're uh, currently in the study phase, and, and this is actually down south. So this is a really cooling dominant application. There are six apartment buildings with one, you know, clubhouse or common building. Um, this is another one that lends itself very well to a common single pipe ambient type um, distribution network. And the nice thing about this is that we've got a lot of different opportunities here for different types of sources and sinks. You can see on the on the left here, we've got actually an open loop and reinjection system with a supplemental pond. Uh, they have a, a, a man-made pond that's going to be about 12 feet deep in the middle. So we can inject in two locations from the pond. We can inject in two locations from the open loop reinjection system. And then we take off to each building and outside of every apartment building is another set of little pump houses that you decouple the building from the single pipe and you've got an injection point right there. And then you've got one ambient pump house that circulates the entire ambient loop. So that was one way to look at it. And in this particular area in the south, open loop reinjection works very well because they've got a lot of groundwater and it's uh, very high water tables and the water is not drinking water. So, uh, but we also looked at a closed loop system. So these green shaded areas would be vertical loops uh, scattered throughout the development. Again, you don't have room enough to put one common loop field in. So you've got to be able to move you know, get enough energy in certain locations, inject that into the ambient, and then you pull off to a couple buildings and then you inject some more heat, or in this case, reject heat. Um, and then you have the option also, if you wanted to do some peak shaving to add two or one or two hybrid systems. Now, again, with ambient systems, you have to balance that one pipe distribution and the energy that's moving around. So in this case, we're gonna do two separate hybrids. That way we can continue to balance, you know, from one end to the other of the development. So you've got basically three buildings up here and then you got three buildings down here and you're just really Okay, 
So there's, you know, again, lots of ways to do that. Um, but the single pipe in this particular case uh, looks to be the more advantageous route versus a two pipe, because uh, again, we're serving multiple buildings in the way that it lays out, uh, rather than running one common loop and two pipes to everything, it, it seems to work a little bit better this way. And then of course, because we're in the south, uh, let's try to get rid of heat. So we're incorporating domestic hot water for each building, pool heating, uh, and then they're looking at a 80% uh, solar PV system to run all the pumps and 50% uh, and of the buildings off of solar just from the roofs of, the, of all the buildings. So it's a, a pretty interesting project. Okay, next slide. Um, this is another, this is a smaller townhome complex. We've got, you can see here, there's uh, a bunch of buildings here. It's only about 60 or 70 tons of capacity. Uh, you've got a common house here, and then you've got all this parking. So we've got a loop field installed underneath the parking lot. It has to come into a vault. There's zero room for any mechanical space in the common uh, other than for some pumps. So unfortunately, had to put in a vault, run into the common house, decouple. You can see we're decoupling the pumps for the loop field side. And then we've got all the heat pumps in the buildings have their own circulator and run back with a two pipe distribution back to the common house uh, where everything is then interconnected. And again, this is in the south. Um, so we're, we're going to reject heat to the heat the pool for the common house. And then we also have a dry fluid cooler for peak shaving um, uh, just to maintain and, and balance the profile over time. Uh, because again, deep south, we want to make sure we don't have any temperature creep. Uh, and then we're also doing desuperheaters de uh, to try to help, you know, get rid of as much heat as we can uh, from the bore field. So this is another interconnected common system with a common loop, uh, but with a two-pipe distribution. This is a downtown business district in the Midwest here that's been installed and operating for uh, seven or eight years now. And um, uh, it was we didn't actually do the design. We're doing a, a study and uh, a viability study because unfortunately uh, there were some issues, and, and so they're just trying to make sure that everything is still viable and works, and and can continue to add buildings. And you know how much more heat exchanger do they need to add? They only added one of the heat exchangers up front. There's 54 buildings that are stubbed for service, but 14 of them have actually converted to geothermal in an operation. So the the current loop field. Um, is more than enough to operate those 14 buildings. And uh, this is a two pipe distribution system. However, um, they ran the loop field in the buildings all in series with one another. So the pumping really as they add more buildings and add more loop fields should be decoupled and, and changed. But at this point it works. And the great thing is they thought that um, you know, what they didn't take into account when they designed this was all that energy, as I mentioned before, about the, the distribution piping. If you run normal, you know, loop sizing software and you run the energy calcs of the, the aggregate load and you look at the loop field, it says that you should be running in the low 30s for a loop temperatures and they're running in the mid 40s. And this is in a heating dominant climate. Uh, these buildings are mostly retail and banks and so forth. So you can clearly see that the distribution piping is picking up a tremendous amount of heat and adding to the system um, that wasn't accounted for and uh, initially in the design. So, you know, we ran some analysis and now we know that we can continue to add a few more buildings without adding any more heat exchanger at this time. So again, this is another way to do it. This is a two pipe system. Uh, but again, on this particular project, there's going to be a little more parasitic pumping loss just because of how it's laid out. And that wasn't really looked at, I don't think, uh, from a big picture, you know, seven, eight years ago when it was designed. So needs to be changed a little bit. And the last project, uh, yeah, I got 10 minutes here. Last project, and then we'll have some questions. Um, this is a New York project. This is uh, the biggest project we're currently working on. This is uh, called the River Link. This is in, in Queens. And um, they're basically looking at interconnecting this entire district and also these homes in Queege Bridge uh, along the East River all to one central plant district system. And also instead of a traditional central plant of running cooling towers, boilers, and you know chillers, uh, this will be primarily all renewable with the um, 
you know, exception of a uh, CHP system, uh, but that will be generating electricity. And, um, and then also uh, uh, there will be potentially some air source heat pump peak shaving devices on, on the site. So this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, there will be a huge district energy plant in this building. These are the first buildings that are being designed currently. We're using river source for a lot of the cooling. Okay, we're also using a lot of vertical heat exchanger underneath the buildings for, for most of the heating energy. The river source isn't working for heating because it gets too close to freezing. And so that's really more for the cooling side. We're also doing sewage heat recovery. Tremendous amount of sewage heat recovery on these projects, the, these multifamily high rise, mid rise buildings, you know, all that, you know, water that's being heated and dumped down the shower drains and, and laundry and so forth, uh, recovering that energy. Also using thermal energy storage to balance, uh, or, or I'm sorry, to help with the peak loads and then some combined heat and power uh, systems to, to uh, generate electricity and um, also some high temperature water uh, for some of the makeup air and some of those type of things. So a uh, lot of different, you know, again, technologies that can all be implemented into district systems. But with this one, most of them are all either renewable or highly efficient. So the opportunities are endless. You know, if you can do this, uh, um, you know, certainly you, you could do almost anything. So with that, I think I will uh, stop there and, and I think uh, we probably have some questions. That, can that we do. Up. So we will start with the first question. What percent of diversity are you actually seeing in all residential district energy systems? Not, not a lot, you know, you're, it depends on if it's apartment buildings or single family, but, uh, and how, you know, how you're going to look at the hot water. Um, but, you know, usually no, no more than 15%, generally around maybe 10, uh, 10, 12% is what we're kind of seeing. And then, um, you know, which is interesting because uh, like the, the one large community in, in uh, with the single pipe ambient, we're seeing about a 10 to 10% uh, energy um, heat transfer of the ambient loop itself, the ambient piping. So, um, you know, it, taking that into account certainly helps. Uh, is there a minimum size district system to justify the cost? No, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think we're going to find out more about that as, uh, you know, heat and, and some of these pilot projects out east are going to happen to look more so at, at that perspective. Unfortunately, I don't know a lot of the financial uh, ramifications of some of the clients that we work with. They don't share their financial, you know, capex and stuff with us. So I, I don't know what the thresholds are. Um, you know, it does seem to be rather large, but, um, uh, you know, again, I think every company would probably say, you know, have a different number in mind. So it, from a technical perspective, obviously it all works. Um, it's really more of a financial question. True. Um, so kind of going back to your ambient loop answer just a second ago, but how much capacity do you account for in the supply return pipings? And how do you model it? Are you yeah. prescriptive when it comes to depth and spacing between those pipes, the header pipes? Yeah, we, we use a software program called Transys, which uh, takes thousands of variables into account in, in every length of pipe, every every lineal foot of pipe and depth and spacing. And so, um, you know, on the on the one project with the, the large community, you know, like I said, we, we saw about a 10% uh, net energy, um, you know, impact off of the ambient loop piping. Uh, we didn't use transis on the community business district in the Midwest here. Uh, I think you're seeing more than that on that particular site because that's a two pipe system and you also have much larger pipes. The one thing with the single pipe ambient, you can downsize that pipe and your flow rates aren't as high. So you're not getting uh, as good a heat transfer and as much obviously with surface area is a key component to that. And then of course your flow rate is also um, so you know, when you have a two pipe distribution system and you're increasing your flow, um, you know, increasing your pipe size, you're, you're, you know, you're getting quite a bit more energy. You know, you, I would say you could probably get more than double of what the single pipe is. So you could be getting as much as 20%. Great. Um, and to kind of follow up on flow, are there any rules of thumb you use on pipe sizing GPM per ton? 
Well, for a two pipe system, you know, we're usually in that industry standard of two and a half to three GPM per ton. Generally, when you're looking at block loads and, and community systems like this, we're not sizing at three GPM per ton. There's really no need for that. That you know, we try to try to lower that down if we can to two and a half. Uh, with the single pipe, you know, it's it's not the industry standard you would expect from geothermal and, and water source equipment of three GPM per ton. It's really about how much flow does it take to maintain a certain delta T from one injection point to the next injection point of your energy sources. And that flow rate is much lower than three GPM per ton. So when talking about pumping, are you using backup pumps, um, lead lag pumps in these pumping stations, just for redundancy? Yes, generally you, you know, you'd have two, two pumps, lead lag, uh, redundant pumps. Yep, correct. Perfect. And I assume you can design these systems for just water, no glycol, and it just impacts the size of the load. Correct, correct, you certainly can. Uh, that was some of the sensitivity analysis that we go through on a lot of these projects is, you know, um, what do we have to do to get to that threshold of, of just having water in it versus antifreeze? Because, you know, that's a lot of cost. and and so forth. So especially the campus work, you know, the campus work that, that we do, most of them, if not all of them have, pretty sure almost all of them, but most of them have uh, just pure water in them and no antifreeze. Do you find that in district systems that makes more sense since it's limiting the requirement for maintenance so you don't have any chemical treatment if you can stick with just strictly water and just looking at inhibitors then? Yeah, it certainly helps. You know, um, we try to design all of our systems with as much plastic pipe as we can. And so, you know, trying to keep the corrosion factors down and, and keeping the chemical treatment to a minimum. And, uh, you know, and again, antifreeze is really more about upfront cost. It's once it's in and it's installed and, you know, obviously if you did a good job and there's no leaks and so forth, then really isn't any other issues, but um, it's just that, that upfront, you know, uh, cost to install it. Uh, Bob Wyman has an interesting question. So in a city like New York, one might eventually build hundreds of micro districts, perhaps one per block. Would it make sense to have a macro district that allows some thermal sharing in between the micro districts? Well, certainly. I mean, you know, um, I, you know, I, you could look at it both ways. Uh, you know, it's it's really that's I think more about a financial question and who's going to own and operate. And it certainly can be done. You know, obviously, you can see from the Riverlink project that's going to be a macro district, if you will. Um, versus what you're looking at up in Massachusetts with a micro district, maybe a neighborhood or a, a just a, just a you know city block with six or eight homes. Um, both are certainly viable. Uh, it really just depends on you know how do you interconnect things? Is there space to do so? It, do you have the ability to have enough source and sink to make that happen? And um, you know uh, who, you know again who's going to pay for it and own and operate it? Sure. How much loop size reduction due to load diversity is needed to justify the added cost of a district system versus just installing individual loops uh, for each home if we talk about residential? Well, the diversity doesn't really play into that equation. That's really more about, again, I keep going back to the, the financial question. It's really more about a company's appetite for their, you know, what's their capex, what's their return on investment um, to go to a community system, you know, uh, Generally, when you look at those type of companies, they have thresholds where they have to have a certain, you know, amount invested in, in, in a certain return on that investment in order to make any financial sense as a company. So um, the diversity doesn't really, you know, play into that other than, um, you know, if you can reduce the overall heat exchanger and still interconnect, that's just better capex and, and opex for them long term, right? That gives them a better return because it takes less upfront cost to get the same job done. So if there's more diversity, the better. You know, um, there's a, a project here right in my neighborhood that's um, being looked at by the city and they wanna incorporate industrial use next to they, you know residential single family. And it's like, okay, now's the time to think about energy sharing because if you're getting rid of heat in the middle of winter, you want heat, you know, that's, that's the bigger questions that need to be looked at, and that that takes a lot of people and you know government and everything um, when you start talking about those kinds of things. But so that kind of leads into I assume this might be a question that 
um, we could defer to another town hall and talk about financing, but um, someone asked, how do you price a district system to homeowners? Do you typically see upfront cost at the initial installation or do you just see monthly usage charges? From my experience um, so far in the ones that we've seen, uh, it's really been just a monthly usage charge. Uh, there hasn't been any, you know, the idea of this is that there isn't any financial upfront to the homeowner. That's why you want to do this because if you can remove that, they're hundred percent going to join the community and beyond the district because there's no additional cost to them. And then there's just a, an energy fee, just like there would be if they're buying gas. So, you know, I don't, it depends on what that fee is, of course, but um, you know, so, so the idea is that there really isn't anything. Now, some of those costs may be rolled into lot prices and there's different ways that the developers are working with the energy partners to make that all happen. Um, but, uh, I, you know, don't think that there's a specific, at least from my knowledge, there's not a specific, yep, you have to pay $10,000 to connect to it, you know, upfront or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say, Fang, if you have an opportunity to go to our YouTube channel, you can watch the co-op presentation and they talk about how as a utility, um, it's a monthly service fee to their customers, uh, for tapping into that or having access to that type of system. Um, so uh, for open loop or pond loop systems, who's usually responsible for the maintenance? The utility or the owners, or how does that usually work? Well, back to my slide early on about, you know, working together and figuring out easements and, but, you know, obviously whoever installs and is owning and operating it is responsible for the maintenance generally. And not always working on a project in New York where they're only responsible for purchasing the equipment, but they're not gonna be responsible for maintaining the equipment. So, you know, we've seen agreements go both ways. Um, it really just depends on, you know, the parties involved and in what their appetite is for maintenance. And when it comes to pond loop and, and you know, or lake loop systems, I would, you know, those don't require a lot. So I would think that the owning and operating company would probably handle that. But, you know, um, if it's a private, lake or pond and, and they don't really have access to that, you know, are you going to create easements and access agreements or how do you work that? Or are you just going to have them do the maintenance? So, I mean, there's, that could go either way. Um, so uh, another question. So single pipe systems um, won't work for hundred thousand buildings, but how would you structure a system for hundred thousand buildings tapping into a system? Um, and is there a document that describes the system being proposed for Queens? This is, these are questions from Bob Wyman. Oh, um, yeah, we're in master planning and and uh, been working on that project for probably two years uh, in Queens. Um, so um, yeah, there's, uh, you know, I don't have any of those documents, but our company does, um, but I'm not sure how much they can share. Uh, anyway, um, thousands of buildings. Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't really know. Um, that's, that's, that's a tough question, <laughs> uh, you know. Um, a single pipe system could it work? I'm, you know, theoretically, sure, but you know that it really just depends on, um, you know, how the whole interconnection, how the, how you interconnect everything, and where are your sources and sinks, you know. But of course, in New York, you've got a lot of opportunities. You know, most of these urban settings like this, all the vertical heat exchangers are going under the buildings, under the footprint of the buildings or the underground parking, and then you've got, you know. A lot of water, uh, you know, we're you know, like in Queens, you're right next to the river. So you've got a tremendous amount of opportunity there. Um, so, you know, interconnecting all those buildings certainly makes sense, but you still gotta be able to get piping from one place to another and, and uh, make sure that the temperature of that piping, you know, in, in fluid is the correct temperature. Now, Queens, that's all gonna be hot water and chilled water. That's different than an ambient type system where you're running geothermal water to all these buildings. But, you know, as most people know, the project in Wisconsin is an ambient system. You've got 14, uh, you've got 9,000 bores. You've got 14 or 15,000 tons of heating and cooling on a campus that's all being shared and each building has its own little plant. So, you know, and you've got a, you've got a combination of single pipe and two pipe on that, on that campus. So, I mean, you know, there's lots of ways to do it. It's just site specific is really key. 
Great. Um, so for district systems, how would you compare a load side four pipe distribution versus source side two pipe in terms of performance and cost? Well, again, back to your load profile and, and site specific. Um, if you're looking at, you know, like campuses, for instance, where you've got a tremendous amount of simultaneous load, you've got people moving throughout the campus. So you have a lot of diversity, tremendous amount of diversity. Your four pipe central plant systems are more efficient because, you know, when you take advantage of simultaneous load at the compressor level, where you're not running two compressors to do heating and cooling, you're only using one, you've effectively doubled your efficiency. You've went from a, you know, three and a half COP to a seven because you're only using one lift, you know, compressor lift to get the job done. Whereas with a uh, distributed unitary type system where you've got heat pumps scattered throughout, one might be in heating and one might be in cooling, but you're still operating two compressors to do those jobs. So yes, you're sharing energy, but you're still using more kilowatts to make all that happen. Whereas if you had one compressor and one was taking the, the cooling and one was taking the heating off of that compressor, now you've got, you know, double the efficiency. So um, in theory, the four pipe central plant system is more efficient. However, there's a lot of caveats to all of this, you know, um, there's you know, pumping energy, there's a efficiency of the actual devices themselves. You know, the smaller the equipment, the more efficient they are generally. Um, although I would say that the mag bearing chillers and some of that stuff is getting really efficient and they can produce you know, pretty hot water um, you know, efficiently, not like uh, you know, small water to water heat pumps where they're not efficient at making 130 degree water where these chillers can make you know, 130, 140 and still be running uh, over three COP. So, I mean, they're, you know, very good at that. Anyway, so again, that's a hard question to answer, but hopefully I did okay. A lot of these questions are hard in theory because they change right. so dramatically depending right. on where we are, but doing a great job. So we have, it looks like one more. Um, yep. How do you see metering gen generally work with multiple owner systems or apartments, single family homes, things like that? Yeah, that's a good question because that, that comes up with every project we work on is how do we want to meter it? Do you want to meter it? Um, so far, none of the projects we're working on are doing individual metering because if you're going to meter energy and, and charge by that usage, you now fall under some of the regulation for what you call a regulated utility. And a lot of the regulations and public utility commissions and so forth, there's some ambig ambiguity how do we say that, uh, of, you know, where does this fall? Is it a, a thermal asset still, but are you still a utility? Are you acting as a utility? So most of the companies or all of them so far are actually not metering individually and charging just a flat fee for energy use, uh, you know, for use of the asset, okay? And they're just figuring out what that might be and, you know, charging for that. Because if it's a flat fee, then it's just a service contract and it's not a utility bill. So that's how they're kind of getting around that. Now, we're also though seeing some of the mid rises and so forth still wanting to know, you know, how much are they using? Um, and certainly from a building level, we're monitoring BTUs, you know, flow temperature BTUs, BTU meters in, out of, you know, all the different devices. But from each individual unit, whether it's a condominium, whether it's a single family home, um, right now they're not doing individual metering, but there are some really neat, uh, BTU meters out there that are becoming more and more low cost that could be utilized uh, in these systems. However, the, the, the question then becomes, especially when it comes to single family and so forth, how do you interconnect all this? How does someone gather this data without a full blown, you know, building automation system, you know, running to all these different homes or buildings and in, in, in apartments or whatever it may be that gets to be very costly. Um, so some companies that have some of this internet web enabled, you know, thermostats that can track energy and some of that, I think that's more the future. It's just allowing different platforms of people to be able to see that information and having agreements in place that allow third party ownership people to view it and not, not you know, you can't go in and change somebody's thermostat, but you can at least gather the data and look and see what they're, you know, what they're using, uh, how things are operating and so forth. So. 
Um, that's a good question. That's, I think, the next frontier with some of this community stuff is really more on the metering and monitoring and how does everything get interconnected so a company can operate it like it was all in one central plant in a, in a room with a BAS system. No, and I think that that question about um, trying to avoid being considered a utility uh, comes up frequently. And so do you, when you're doing some of these district systems, do you get any pushback from any utility saying, well, technically that really is providing a service or you're providing the utility service, but you're selling it as a service? I haven't. I mean, I'm not, you know, obviously on the front lines and in, in meetings with those companies and, and uh, hearing anything that they're getting back from whether it's city uh, officials or regulatory bodies. But, um, you know, so far, all of them have gone through that, that, that I've worked on, you know, without any issue. Doesn't mean it won't come in, you know, in the future as more and more companies like this become, you know, out there in the marketplace and are doing this type of work, I, you know, I think there will eventually be a battle uh, with, with, you know, regulation versus pre-market and how that all works. And, and um, so, you know, but we're such small potatoes at the moment that I don't think that they really care. Keyword at the moment. I'm hoping that that is just now. Um, one last question. I really appreciate everybody hanging on. Um, when they're charging a flat monthly fee, are the, who's generally responsible for the heat pump and the parasitic electrical cost and who's really responsible for overall system efficiency? Yeah, um, well, so unfortunately I've been involved in some of the contract negotiations between third parties and the clients and, and asked to do, you know, uh, give opinions and peer reviews, et cetera. And most of them do not own the heat pumps. There is, you know, one that is actually owning the heat pumps. And so then it's, then the whole entire system is really a, a, a lease cost or a, you know, service fee cost, including the heat pump. Uh, but most of them do not, most of them stop at some demarcation point of, you know, where you either have building entry or a heat exchanger or, you know, something. And then of course, all the pumping energy that goes into delivering the, thermal energy um, is on the owner operator and not on the building use or the or the tenants or the you know whoever the end user is now of course if it's a if it's a condominium building or a townhome building with one central pump that would then get added into maybe a homeowners association monthly fee um, or something like that that they're all because if, if they're not net metered or if they're not uh, you know, anything like that, they don't know exactly who's using what, then they just add it. A lot of these have homeowners associations, which makes things a little easier when it comes to billing and, and so forth. And, and developers and these third party companies really like the, the, the homeowner association uh, model, because it just makes things easier when you only have one client then to work through for billing and so forth. Um, so that's how they kind of handle some of those and, and split that up. But again, you've seen it a couple different ways. It's really uh, depends on the client and in what their expectations are. Great. I, it's honestly, this has been a fantastic presentation and I think really speaks well to everything going on in the marketplace. I mean, these district systems are becoming more and more uh, prevalent in conversations and I see so many utilities with interest in them. I know we personally were challenged by an investor owned utility years ago saying, listen, it, I love the idea of 10 homes, but I have millions of customers. So give me bigger, better ideas. And I think this truly answers that question. It answers that call to do to active uh, is these larger district systems. And it really is uh, a way for them to get involved. Um, so that was all the questions for today. I appreciate everyone hanging on um, for these extra 15 minutes. And I thank you so much, Brian. Your information has been great. And I do look forward to being able to do a follow-up presentation more about district systems in a campus environment. Um, so I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, and just as a heads up to everyone, yes, we will be having our next town hall in July. We will send the invitation out. And as I mentioned, it kind of follows along the same theme. We'll be hearing from Eversource and Heat in Massachusetts as they are really getting involved in the design process for their district system owned by utilities. So it should be very interesting. But again, if anyone has any questions, feel free to contact Brian. His email address is listed on the screen or we'd be happy to share that to you. 
or you can send an in, uh, email to info at eggs.org and we'll be happy to answer from there as well. Uh, we will be taking this recording and putting it on our YouTube channel. So if you need to rewatch or have any other questions, uh, please feel free to contact us. But otherwise, thank you everyone for your time today and we will look forward to seeing everyone again soon. Have a great day. Thank you.